Okay, we've been blessed with another opportunity, wonderful opportunity that we can come together to worship God in spirit and in truth, the best manner that we understand how from a diligent study of his word. And we're going to jump right into our study this morning. And uh, again, we are in the Olivet Discourse. We are looking at verse 29 of Matthew 24. And we have looked at already where Jesus says immediately after the tribulation, referring back to what he had said earlier, the great tribulation, as he quoted from Daniel 12, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And so as we look at this passage, and we've looked at, uh, in the previous study, we looked at some of the uh, some of this kind, same kind of language, and that's what we were looking at, the Hebrew language, this, this hyperbolic, uh, sometimes apocalyptic, this judgment language that is used uh, many times in the Old Testament. And we find that Jesus here is using the same language, and the reason is he is quoting, citing, echoing, and conflating prophecies that were predicted, foretold by these prophets of things that would take place in Israel's last days, Old Covenant Israel's last days. God made promises to Old Covenant Israel, and because God cannot lie, then he had to fulfill those promises. And so then this is what we are looking at. And so as we look at the phrase here of this verse, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Well, Mark's rendering of Jesus' words is very, very similar. The powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And as well as Luke, and he says, uh, the powers of the heaven, the, excuse me, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And so, as I said, we have looked at, and remember, uh, we looked at Joel 2 in the last study. And now remember, Joel 2 predicted a day of darkness and a gloominess, a day of clouds, thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and a strong, and he said, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall there be any more after it. So this day of the Lord event that Joel is predicting in his prophecies and we see here, in, as you drop down a little bit further, he uses this exact same language that Jesus is quoting here. The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, the stars shall withdraw their shining, and the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. Remember that he is the Lord of Sabaoth, the Lord of armies. And so he was going to uh, utter his voice before his army. His camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. And so this event that Joel is foretelling here was, a, was another prediction of the last day's day of the Lord judgment. And within the things, the way that he describes this, he uses the same language, this uh, hyperbolic language. Uh, the sun being dark, stars falling from heaven, and so forth. And then again, he repeats this in chapter 3 and verse uh, 16 in particular. He said, The Lord shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people. Okay, so again, we, we want to try to understand what this phrase means, and we want to allow Scripture to interpret Scripture, not to approach a passage, this passage, or one like it, and try to interpret it in a literal, physical, materialistic manner and say, well, now this is predicting, you know, this great cataclysm uh, of the destruction of the entire universe. No, we want to allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. And so, uh, I will refresh our memories just a little bit, and we looked at this early on in this study in Isaiah chapter 2. And remember now, Isaiah 2 through 4 was 
also the prediction of the last days, day of the Lord, judgment against Judah and Jerusalem, verse 1 of chapter 2. And remember that as you drop on down in that text, and again, read all of these chapters that I'm referring to, uh, I'm just touching on certain points to show how that Jesus is conflating these prophecies. So we have to go back and get the context of those prophecies. And so, and that's that's another thing that we need to understand that when any writer or speaker that we read about in what we call the New Testament quotes from an Old Testament, then he is drawing that entire context into the minds of his audience. Not just, he's not just picking out one little word or phrase and then giving it a whole new meaning. He's pulling that context, the reasons that they quote from the Old Testament prophecies, not only for it to be fulfilled, but they're pulling that context into the minds of the audience. And so this is going to be, in, in Isaiah 2, this is going to be a last day's day of the Lord judgment against Judah and Jerusalem. And so uh, as we see there in verse 19, that he was going to arise and shake terribly the earth. Now, again, we've looked at this and we've seen that Paul quotes verbatim from this verse in his epistle in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And he says that this would be fulfilled when they would see the Lord Jesus come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel. That they would be uh, those that were persecuting the Thessalonians. They would be destroyed. They would have the persecution turned back on them. That would give the Thessalonians relief from their persecution. And so again in verse 21, same thing, he says the same thing again, that he was going to rise and shake terribly the earth. And as I said, we have looked at this in, in the last lesson in Isaiah 13, but I wanted to make another point here from this. We see the same language, and this was the prediction of the destruction of Babylon. Okay, and so he uses the same kind of language in we see in verse 8 the, the motif there of the travail, woman in travail, and verse 9, the day of the Lord. So it's called a day of the Lord event. And verse 10, then, the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened and is going forth. The moon shall not cause her light to shine. In verse 13, then, of that text, therefore I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place. So again, we see the same kind of language that is used in the prediction of destruction of Babylon. And again, there's verse 19 there. And Babylon, the glory of the kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans, excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. So they were going to be utterly destroyed. Now, the point that I want to make here is because this was the destruction of Babylon, when we come to the book of Revelation, this is dealing with the judgment of Babylon. But the, the term Babylon is being applied figuratively to Jerusalem because Jesus identified, John identified Babylon as the entity upon which all the righteous bloodshed on the earth would come. Jesus said all the righteous bloodshed on the earth would come on Jerusalem in Matthew 23 there toward the end of that chapter. And so Jesus, when you, uh, again, Euclid's axiom, things equal to the same thing are equal to each other. So Jesus said all the righteous bloodshed would come on Jerusalem. John said all the righteous bloodshed would come on, would come on Babylon. Mystery Babylon, the harlot. So that's the the point that I want to make there and, and note uh, the, the irony, if you will, that Babylon was going to be destroyed when Israel <clears throat> was released from Babylonian captivity, but then in later years, Israel is called Babylon. And uh, but anyway, I just I wanted to make that note there. But in we see again the same language, and and that's what Jesus is talking about here, the destruction of Jerusalem, old covenant Israel, when the powers of the heavens would be shaken. And again, the same language used in foretelling the destruction of of actual physical Babylon back at that time. And so then. We find this same language again 
in Ezekiel 38, where he says, For in my jealousy and in my the fire of my wrath have I spoken, surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. Okay, all right, now again, read Ezekiel 38 and 39. <clears throat> because it is foretelling this great battle, this great war of Gog and Magog. Okay? And this was going to be a last day's judgment. It would come in the latter years, verse 8. And this would be a judgment against Israel because they had violated the covenant, the, their covenant with God, their marriage covenant, if you will. And so, again, we see this same language in verse 20, uh, verse uh, 19. For in my jealousy and the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and the creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. Notice that this great shaking would be at his presence. And what do we have in the Olivet Discourse? Jesus is talking about his parousia, which means presence. They shall shake at my presence, and the mountains shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. Okay, so, uh, all right, again in verse 22 there, uh, I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. I will rain upon him and upon his bands, upon many people that are with him, and overflowing rain, and great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Again, the exact same kind of language that we've looked at in those three examples uh, that we looked at from Psalms 18, Isaiah 13, and Isaiah 34 in the previous lesson. Okay, so the reason that I point this out, and, and again, when we look at this broad spectrum of these prophecies, we see one picture, and we see all of these pieces, if you will, puzzle pieces, that fit together perfectly, and they are all pointing to this one event, and that would be this last day's judgment against Old Covenant Israel, thus fulfilling all of God's promises that he made to Israel. And so this battle of Gog and Magog that we read here of in Ezekiel 38 and 39, we find this spoken of as John in the book of Revelation in chapter 20. And again, I'm not going to read all these verses. Uh, take the time to read that on your own time. But this is where we have this mysterious uh, thousand-year reign of Christ uh, that uh, has caused so many theories and, and so forth in the religious realm. But here's what I want us to notice. Uh, following this, in verse 7, when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. Now notice, Gog and Magog, to gather them to, it's actually the battle, but to gather them to the war, if you look at the actual language, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away there's what Jesus says a little bit later in our Olivet Discourse here. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall never pass away. And that's what he said in Matthew chapter 5. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So here John is seeing this, and he says, from whose face, he gets set on the throne now, from whose face 
the heavens and the earth fled away, and there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. That's Daniel 7. That's Daniel 12. The opening of the books, judgment. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Matthew 16, 27. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, death and hell, that's Hades there in the original, death and Hades delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell, Hades, was cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And so th this is one of the uh, misunderstood misconceptions even in the churches of Christ today. And that is that uh, the, the millennium, what they call the millennium, this thousand years that is mentioned here in Revelation 20, that this millennium didn't begin until A.D. 70. And therefore, we are still in the millennium today. Again, that's a very popular argument. But that is false because when the when the millennium ends, it is followed by this battle of Gog and Magog, which from prophecy is a judgment against Israel. Well, Israel is no longer in existence. Physical Israel, spiritual Israel, we are spiritual Israel. All Christians are spiritual Israel. That's what Paul teaches in Galatians chapter 3 and going into chapter 4. You're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Uh, there's neither male nor female, bond nor free, Jew nor Greek. We're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be in Christ, then are you Abraham's seed, he says there in Galatians 3. And so all Christians are spiritual Israel. So there is no ethnic Israel in existence today. Therefore, this battle of Gog and Magog cannot be something that is predicted yet for our future. And even aside from that, in this Olivet Discourse, in Luke's record, Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem encircled with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things that are written shall be fulfilled. Well, Ezekiel 38 and 39 was things that were written. And Jesus said, that was going to be the time when all those things would be fulfilled. And that's Luke 21, verses 20 through 22. And so I just I wanted to show that, that from Ezekiel 38 and 39, we have this great shaking in the land of Israel. And this would be the battle of Gog and Magog, or at least tied to it. And here we see in Revelation that this battle of Gog and Magog ensues, and at the end of it, then we have the great white throne judgment, which is Daniel 7 and Daniel 12. And that, and it's also Matthew 25, which we haven't got to. But that, that, that's how all these things fit together perfectly. So now we want to look at, again, how can we define, how can we figure out what it means, what, what this phrase means, the powers of the heavens, shall be shaken. Well, when we come to Hebrews chapter 12, we find here, and, and, and actually just practically the entire letter of this, of the Hebrews here, to the Hebrews, is a contrast between covenants, the Old Testament covenant and the new covenant of Christ. And so Paul, if Paul's the writer, and I believe he was, but whoever the writer is, when he comes here in chapter 12, he makes this unmistakable contrast between the two covenants. In verse 18, he says, For you are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burnt with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness uh, and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore, for they could not endure uh, that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it, sh it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. So 
this obviously uh, <clears throat> Paul is re reminding his audience the Hebrews of when Moses came to Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments and when he went up on the mountain and God's presence came down there in the fire and in the cloud the mountain shook and so forth that's what he's talking about here and he says this is not what you've come to but you are come and that is in the uh, aorist tense or perfect tense I forgot now I have to go back and look uh, but he is saying you have arrived you are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God the heavenly Jerusalem again he's you, you've not come to this old covenant to the to the Mount Sinai you've come to Mount Zion you've come to the city of the living God and if you back up and read chapter 11 of Hebrews that's what Abraham was looking for he was looking for that heavenly country and he and the Hebrew writer says this is what you have arrived at you have come to Mount Zion to the city of the living God the heavenly Jerusalem and to an innumerable company of angels to the general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven and to God the judge of all and the spirits of just men made perfect and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel see that you refuse not him that speaketh for if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth Moses much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven whose voice then shook the earth but now, now notice the who, who, what, notice the timing here now when is that that's Paul's now whose voice then shook the earth but now hath he promised saying yet once more I shake not the earth only but also heaven and this word yet once more signifies the removing of those things that are shaken as the things that are made that those things which cannot be shaken may remain wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken same word in the original it's translated moved in the King James Version so he's saying those things that are made what's he talking about what's the contrast the old covenant versus the new covenant the things that are made are the things that pertain to the old covenant the temple and the sacrifices and all that ritualistic stuff things that are that's what's about to be shaken okay and he says this word yet once more signifies the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made that those things which cannot be shaken well that's the new covenant so that they may remain wherefore we receiving present tense we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear and the last verse there that I didn't have in the note here for our God is a consuming fire now notice that he says here in verse 26 whose voice then shook the earth but now hath he promised see that's prophecy what God promised was prophecy okay so when when he when Paul says this then he's referring and reminding his audience of prophecy so then the question is what is he where is he quoting from where is he drawing this idea from of this yet once more well he's quoting from Haggai chapter 2 and when we look at chapter 2 verses 6 and 7 for thus saith the Lord of hosts yet once it is a little while and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land and I will shake all nations and the desire of all nations shall come and I will fill this house with glory saith the Lord of hosts okay now if we go back to what I just said and we allow scripture to interpret scripture 
we want to let Scripture define what this phrase means, shaking the powers of heaven. What does that mean? Well, it is defined right here in Haggai, when we drop on down just a little bit there in that chapter, where he says, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms, and I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen, and I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them, and the horses, and the riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. Okay, so here we have defined in Haggai what this phrase means to shake heavens and earth. And so again, when we allow Scripture to interpret Scripture, this shaking of the heavens, this is talking about the removing of powers and authorities in government of a kingdom. Removing the throne, the reign. That's what a throne means. It means the reign. It doesn't just mean a wooden chair that an important man sits on. It's talking about his reign. And it's used in the same way in we just looked at from Isaiah 13 that this kingdom of Babylon, and again, Daniel 7, the prophecy there, when Daniel interpreted the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, he said, you are this head of gold. Well, that was the Babylonian kingdom. And they would be subdued by the next kingdom in, in succession, which was the Mede-Persian kingdom, came in and destroyed. And when you read Isaiah 13, it even says there, I will stir up the Medes against you. Okay? And so, when we look at this language, for the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Heaven and earth shall pass away. This is not talking about the physical material universe being shaken and rock and rolling and, and uh, falling apart and, and atoms disassociating from one another. It, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about removing kingdoms, removing the reign of kingdoms. That's how it's being used in these prophecies that Jesus is conflating here as well as Paul in Hebrews, quoting from Haggai, that this these throne, this reign, was going to be done away with. The reign of old covenant Israel was going to be done away with. And so when he would shake the heavens and the earth, the dry land and the sea, then that was going to be the removing of the things that are made, as Paul says in Hebrews 12, so that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. And so as Jesus says here in our verse, immediately after the tribulation of those days when they would see the abomination of desolation set up in the land of Judea, when they would experience the great tribulation, then uh, he says, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then, again, there's another time word, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And so uh, I want to stop the study here, and we're going to look at some of the phraseology of verse 30 then as we continue on in our next study. But I just, I wanted us to look at this language, this Hebrew hyperbolic language, and to understand that this language does not depict the removing of the physical planet, the destruction of the physical universe. It's never used that way in the Bible. It's only when we modern uh, 20 and 21st century people with a Hollywood style mindset approach these scriptures and we don't look at the Old Testament scriptures, and we try to interpret these things in a literal manner, then that's where we go awry. And that's why there are so many just fantastical doctrines out there uh, that, and so many misunderstandings that are based on just not understanding and not knowing that, the, that this prophecy here, particularly in Matthew 24, is predicting 
the end of the Jewish age. And that's the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Those things will be removed so that the new covenant would uh, continue on because it could not be shaken. So anyway, we'll stop our study here and uh, then Lord willing in the next uh, study go into uh, verse 30. <clears throat>